a, uh, also, did we start the offering around for missions? No. Okay. Where was that? Oh, here it is. Okay. I'm just going to start on this side of the room. Just make sure it gets around. The well, first Sunday of the month, we always collect. Um, we uh, are currently giving to uh, a family that is serving in uh, Northern Asia. And uh, we can't even tell where they... It's a, they are serving under a communist nation. So, anyway. We're talking today about the green-eyed monster. You know what the green-eyed monster is? Probably if you're younger, you may not have ever heard of the green-eyed monster. Yeah. Jealousy. You know Tom Brady, New England Patriot quarterback? So many of us just can't stand him. Because a, a team wins generally all the time. And whatever team uh, you're a fan of, Broncos and the Steelers and some of us that have our teams, uh, get very upset when they have to play the Patriots and get the starts knocked out of them. And so, I, you know, I, I just can't stand Tom Brady. And then I really analyzed it, and I thought, you know, the guy is super good looking. Super macho. He's super rich. He's super talented. You know, arguably the best quarterback in NFL history. Arguably. He's super famous. He's married to a supermodel. What's not to hate? Yeah. And I, I realize that the resentment, most of it, is just plain old jealousy. Because <laughs> I don't look like him. Yeah. Though. Have his money, you know. <laughs> so I know. It's not the same, though. <laughs> First Samuel, we're in the 18th chapter today. If you have your Bibles, and I encourage you strongly, bring a Bible. And Because, uh, again, sometimes you won't even need to open it. It's all up there, but you always may want to put a note or underline something or mark something in your Bible. First Samuel 18, starting in verse 1. Now last week we saw how David, as a boy, fought a giant when all the armies of Israel wouldn't touch him. Scared to death. David challenges him. He's already been anointed to be king. Even though that will not happen, his coronation will be years down the line. And you and I are anointed for a work in God's kingdom. And sometimes it, it takes a while before we come into the fullness of whatever that ministry is. Verse 1, after David had finished talking with Saul, remember, he slays the giant. He talks with Saul before he slays Goliath, and then he kills Goliath, and then he comes back and he meets with Saul again to talk about his, his family connections. So after he finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Talk about caring enough for somebody to give them the shirt off your back. That's what's happening. And this friendship between David and Jonathan is one of the deepest, richest, and closest in all of Scripture. And we're going to talk in a couple of weeks about the, the, the deepness and the richness and the goodness of that very, very, very close friendship. But David had killed Goliath, and prior to this time, he would be summoned to the palace uh, to play the part for Saul whenever Saul would be tormented uh, by an evil spirit. And then he would return home, he'd stay there a day or two and play, and everything would calm down, and then David would return to his father's sheep. But now, Saul, he's killed Goliath, and Saul's moved him right into uh, his own house. So he's a permanent resident uh, in the house of the king. Whenever, we're told this in verse 5, uh, whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully, Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. You know something? You can never go wrong applying your best, giving it your all, whatever you're called to do. 
on a job or career, you'll never be promoted, you'll never get a raise if you don't give it your all. It, it will not guarantee you, always, when you give it your best, uh, that you're going to get that raise, you're going to get that promotion. Sometimes, you know, the boss is going to choose that cute little girl that's half his age, and she's going to get the promotion for certain reasons, yeah. <laughs> and you'll get skipped over. But the point is this, if you don't give it your all, there's no way you're ever going to be promoted. We have to give everything our all. Most of you know, for 30 years before I was pastoring, I was performing. Yeah, that was my career for many, many years. And, and it's a, it's, it's a, it was very rare, it's rare in show business to uh, have a sustained career where you can pay your bills <laughs> in, any, in any artistic pursuit. But God was good to us and we always paid our bills. But we had a slack period back in the early 90s uh, where we were at a hotel. Down at the, some of you may remember Main Street Station, they opened it. Uh, we were working there, and then they cut our entertainment fee, which was sizable, and said we could stay for an hourly, and I said, no, thank you, and I left there. And I was also, at that time, trying to go to UNLV and complete my teaching degree that I had started on many years earlier. So I thought, if I'm just going to work for an hourly, I can go work in a restaurant, because my work was slack. So it didn't matter that I, you know, this was not my main calling, so I worked at Marie Callender's about 25 years ago. And I was darn good, is all I can tell you. I waited on people the way I wanted to be waited on. They never waited for a drink. They never had to ask for a napkin, a bottle of ketchup. I mean, I wanted to be right there. I prided myself on giving them good service. I got fan letters <laughs> at Marie Calendars. I mean, I did that job well. Now, I wasn't there to get a promotion. I was there to survive. It was an unusual time of my life because one day I'd be slicing pie and dipping a tie into ranch dressing. <laughs> a couple days later, I'd get on an airplane, fly to Atlanta, be picked up in a limousine with my sister and brother, do a show, ta-da, you know. Everything was great, made some nice money, go back home, go back to UNLV, cut pie, wait on people, did that like nine months. I wasn't going, you know, the thing was, it wasn't to be promoted. It was not my life's calling. I loved doing it because I loved being with people. But I laid my head on the pillow at night and I felt good. Yeah. I had a good attitude. And one of the highest compliments I ever got was somebody who knew me from way back in Sunday school. She was one of my Sunday school teachers. And the, the last job I had before, in fact, simultaneous to beginning this church, I was dealing cards, dressed like Rod Stewart, at the Imperial <laughs> Palace. And she came in, and she'd seen me on stage, she'd seen me on television, I mean, you know. And she said, she saw me at the table, she had dealing with these six people in front of me, and she said, you know, Bill, everything you do, you do well. That stayed with me. That is my call. And it should be all of our calls as Christians. Now, a pastor years ago said, now we're talking about David and everything he did, he did successfully because he did it well. And God was with him. And I remember a pastor years ago talking about the Christian directory. You ever see those Christian directories so you can go to Christian businesses? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said, they put those out so you know what businesses to avoid. <laughs> That's sadly the truth. I had to have a chair reupholstered back in the 80s and I looked through the yellow pages, and here was this ad, and I think it was called King's Upholstery. I don't even know if they're still in business. I think that was the name. And it had a fish symbol. Christians. Okay. So they came to the house, picked out a fabric, sent the chair off. They brought the chair back. It looked beautiful. There was no padding in the seat. It was like, boom, I just barely got the thing. And the next thing you know, it's already looking like a sway back horse. You know. Christians. Christians. On the other hand, we were talking about uh, Dolar uh, Automotive on my side of town. These people are Christians and they act like Christians. And I'll tell you, the word of mouth gets around because they're honest, they're fair, they do the work. They're on Tropicana right here, Pagos, if any of you live on that side of town. The place to get your car fixed. And uh, they're beautiful people. What That gives glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, so whatever, whenever, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We should do everything for God's glory. We should attach, approach every task in life like we want to win a gold medal in that category. 
So whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it so successfully that Saul promoted him. And David was popular with the people. And we pick up in verse 6. When the men were returning home, after David had killed the Philistine, and that's Goliath, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing and joyful songs with tambourines and lutes. And they danced when they sang. Saul has slain the slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands. La, 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 la. David tens of thousands. Or something like that. <laughs> Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. Isn't it wonderful that the Bible has the word galled in it? This refrain galled him. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but with me, only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom, you think? And from that time all on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. I just picked a picture of that green-eyed monster. I just picture the Grinch. Yeah, that's what's going on inside King Saul. A jealous eye. Now, don't raise your hand when I ask you this. Just this is a rhetorical question. Have you ever been jealous of anyone? I know better. I know that you have. There will always be somebody who's better looking than you are, younger, more popular, stronger, richer, that's right, more talented. Now, jealousy may not seem like a major sin, and we laugh about it, but it's one step or two away from murder. And it manifests itself in you and in me, either in trying to harm that person in words, or if there's some other way we can do it, or in our hearts. And as we know from Scripture, Jesus looks on our heart. God looks on the heart. He knows what's going on. I have my little stories about Jim Mitchell back in junior high school. I think I brought you up to sixth grade last week. Let's go up a little, few grades beyond that. <laughs> so I had this friend that I met in sixth grade. His name was Jim Mitchell. We lived out in the country, and Jim moved out from town, and he just lived right over the hill from us on a farm, and, and we became really good friends. He was my best friend, and all went well. And then we got into seventh grade, and there were a bunch of little neighborhood kids, my brother and Jimmy Mitchell and David Anthony, and the four of us, we kind of played around together after school. Well, I'm in seventh grade, and I've told this story before. So we turn to another channel, if you've already know this, but... <laughs> When we got into seventh grade in junior high school, they separated us into grade categories. Yeah. So if you made A's, you were in the A group, B's in the B group, C's in the C group, and, and, and such as that. Yeah. What group were you? I was in the C group. I'm ashamed to say. You see, I, the story is I like to play around after school, and I didn't realize that if you want to make good grades, you might have to bring home a book and study. <laughs> But Jim was in the A group. And the difference between the A group and the C group was the A kids were like in Technicolor and the C group kids were like in black and white. Yeah. They were sharp and, and, that, and they were all popular and they looked better than we did. And it just was a lot to deal with in seventh grade. But it didn't stop me from playing around. And then I tell the story. When I got into eighth grade, I finally woke up and said, I, I want to make good grades. This is embarrassing. Yeah, in fact, in eighth grade, for some reason, they put me in the Jacques Cousteau group. <laughs> That's for those who are beneath and below sea level. <laughs> so, anyway, that made me wake up. I began to study and I made good grades, but it was too late to be put in a higher thing because when we went into ninth grade, they mixed all the kids up, okay? Got, this, got the picture? So ninth grade, now Jim was, you know, when I was in seventh and eighth grade, I, I, I was, I looked like an 11, 12 year old kid. I, I didn't, you know, I was short, skinny, my face was breaking up. Jim like developed, he like got the beard, you know. So he was, and he was a good looking kid, and he, and he could make good grades without even studying. You know, he could just read the book and take the test, yeah. So ninth grade, now he's running for 
class president. And the green-eyed monster was working in my heart. There was no way I could have this kid who already was better looking, taller, and made better grades be my president. Yeah. So I had a bumper sticker on my bicycle that said, I'm with her. Yeah. I didn't want him winning. <laughs> you, oh, quickly you forget. Remember Hillary? Oh, you, 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 you burned her out of... Okay, forget about it. Well... So anyway, Jim's running for class president and some other kids were running. And then the day came for the kids to give their speech in the auditorium. And Jim got, got up and gave his speech and he kind of was slouched over and he kind of mumbled and he got a nice reaction and then he sat down. And then another kid that was running, Luke Kaminsky, got up and he gave his speech and he had some funny lines in it and the kids laughed and, you know, wow. And I'm thinking, yeah, I think they're going to go for Luke. We went back to our home rooms. We took up those little pieces of paper. We wrote down the names, you know. And I wrote big dark letters, Luke Kaminsky. <laughs> and we folded them up and then they counted them. And a little while later, later in the day, they on came the PA system and they said, we'd like to announce the winners of the class offices. And they started with ninth grade. And they said, class president, and there was a pause. And my heart pounded. Please not Jim, please not Jim, please not Jim. Lou Kaminsky, oh. yes! <laughs> it was at the end of the day and I got on the school bus. I felt taller. And you know what was happening? Kids are so nice in junior high school. As Jim was going down the hall getting on the bus. Other kids were chanting at him, Aha, Mitchell, you lost. Remember junior high school, high school? Amazing we survived, right? <laughs> so I got on the bus with Jim and other kids, and the kids were kind of taunting him on the way home. And I was taught, you know, to, to not say nasty things to people. So I just said it behind her back or I kept it to myself, you know. <laughs> but I remember just this wonderful feeling like, yeah, I feel good. I feel good that he's down, yeah. It's so ugly, isn't it? Yeah. So ugly. Well, tw 20 years and more later, at my 20 year reunion, now I'm 37, and there's Jim Mitchell and a bunch of other people in their late 30s. And I have a picture at home of Jim and me putting our arms around each other in a parking lot. You know, Jim now at 38, he was shorter than I was. Real gray. A lot more slouched. He was going to be a lawyer, he always said in high school. He, I'm going to be a lawyer. But he was working for, uh, like, managing a convalescent home or something in West Virginia. I was doing a show in Las Vegas. I was doing some television, you know. I felt like now we could be friends, you know. <laughs> It's so ugly. <laughs> it really is. It's just, you look back on that kind of stuff, and that was junior high. And, and, and I'll tell you the truth, I'm not, I'm not really a jealous person. But like any human being, I've had my times of jealousy. You know what it is? It's, it's not what Jim was. It's what I felt I wasn't. It's insecurity. And I'll tell you, the great sin of jealousy in a Christian is discontent. It's like saying to God, you haven't figured out where I'm supposed to be. You know, I don't like where I am. And that's sin. Because God knows. And you know, sometimes people, we're in a winter season. You know, we're not in the season of reward. We're not in the harvest season yet. And that's why we're given examples like Joseph in Scripture, who for years were in this position before they were elevated. I mean, when you're 12, 13 years old with a face broken out, you know, <laughs> struggling with uh, everything. That's not where you're going to be when you're 40, you know. Insecure King Saul, and he kept a jealous eye on David. The next day, verse 10, an evil spirit from God. You mean the evil spirit wasn't there when he got the jealous eye on David? Man, I, I think that helped to invite an evil spirit. An evil spirit from God, God just basically gave Saul over to himself, basically. Came forcefully, forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house. So I don't know what that prophecy was, because it wasn't God, a godly prophecy. It was a demonic spirit. So he's prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand. Oh, what do you know? I got a spear. 
And he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. See, evil's associated with jealousy. We see murder. I mean, it's real obvious. He wants to kill David. And it's associated with this jealous spirit. What did David do to deserve this treatment? Nothing. What did Jim Mitchell do to deserve my attitude? You know, he couldn't help it. The poor guy was good looking and super smart and popular. Poor thing. Poor thing. <laughs> Don't you wish. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had left Saul. Aha! David had a relationship with God and King Saul didn't. And whose fault was that? It was King Saul's. King Saul started off just like David. He was humble. He came out from you know, nothing. He, he, at least he thought he came from nothing. He was a head and shoulders or so taller than the other men. And, and he was an outstanding uh, young man. But we see him at the beginning, as he's anointed to be king, prophesying, celebrating the Lord. People don't even recognize him because he's so different. But he's been operating under his own rules. He's been operating in the flesh. And he's operating now, of course, in the flesh, in the worst part of the flesh. You know, I never actually threw a spear at Jimmy Mitchell. But if I had had one, <laughs> you know, who knows? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3. Paul says to that church, and man, the church in America today is so much like the church in Corinth. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? And I like this, are you not acting like mere humans? Think about that. In Scripture, it's, it's, it's criticizing people for acting like mere humans. Because when we come into God's kingdom, we should be acting in a, high, in a higher way. That's why it's so troubling and disappointing when you see Christians acting un, in an, un, an ungodly way and backbiting and these sorts of things. And I hear these things all the time from pastors, what's going on in their churches, and I think, what Bible are they reading? What Jesus are they following? You know? David is acting in the spirit. 13, so he sent King Saul, sent David away from him and gave him a command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns in everything he did. He had great success because the Lord was with him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Saul said to David, here's my older daughter Mirab. I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. <laughs> so jealousy carried out leads to murder in one way or another. If not an actual knife in the back, you know, another kind of knife in the back. So he promises his oldest daughter, Mirab, to David. And then we see David's response, but David said to Saul, Who am I? And what is my family or my father's clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? So when the time came for Mirab, Saul's daughter, to be given to David, she was given in marriage to Adriel of Mahola. Nice guy, this king Saul. Throws a spear at David while David's playing soothing music for him on the harp. He sends David to fight the Philistines, hoping that he'll be killed in battle. Nice guy. And basically, on the day David's scheduled to get married, Saul brings in another groom, walks past the wedding cake on the table, and knocks off the little plastic groom statue of David, and puts another guy on there, you know. Very nice. William Penn you know, the Bible does say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You know, the older I've gotten in life and the old, longer I've walked with the Lord, that's, like, that's so real for me. I do not want to say I'm going to do something if I'm not, and I, I, my word has to mean something because it's reflecting on the one I serve. William Penn said the jealous are troublesome to others, but a torment to themselves. Don't we see this? This is King Saul, and this is just the beginning. Because we're going to see in subsequent chapters that 
that Saul is just tormented, trying to rid the earth of David. Verse 20. Now Saul's daughter Michael was in love with David. And when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him, and so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul said to David, Now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. See, the way Saul is acting toward David is just like that Roadrunner cartoon we saw with Wiley Coyote. You know, he just keeps trying to set traps for David, and David keeps eluding them. <laughs> He's the Roadrunner, you yeah. know, without even trying because God's with him. Meet me. <laughs> the safe falls on. <laughs> Woo! Boom. Yeah. On King Saul. So, here he is. Now he's going to offer his problem child to David. Yeah. Reminds me of the old joke. This young lady comes home from a date with her fiancé. And she says to her mother, I'm breaking up with Jack. Jack doesn't believe there's a hell. And her mother said, honey, you marry him, we'll show him. <laughs> so that's what's going on. He figures, my daughter, she's giving me so much trouble at home, she'll make David's life a living hell. So they repeated these words to David, but David said, do you think it is a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I'm only a poor man and a little known. When Saul's servant told him that what David had said, Saul replied, Say to David, the king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. Now, let's just think about this a moment. The Princess Michael is going to get married. And you find out where she's registered. And of course you find out that she's registered at Saul Mart. <laughs> That's darn good. I came up with that myself. You won't get this kind of humor at Canyon Ridge, Central Christian, ICLV. Don't look for it there. Don't even try. Get your laser lights. <laughs> so you look over the register. Oh, a blender. Crock pot. Fluffy towels for me. <laughs> a box of Philistine foreskins. A hundred count. <laughs> How do you gift wrap the thing like that? <laughs> <laughs> when the attendants told David these things, verse 26, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. So the allotted time elapsed. David and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. He brought their foreskins and presented the full number to the king so that he might become the king's son-in-law. And I'm just wondering who did the counting. <laughs> then David gave his daughter, then Saul gave his daughter Michael in marriage. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him. And he remained his enemies, the rest of, enemy, the rest of his days. As the old expression goes, with friends like that, who needs animus? <laughs> You're loving this, Ben. You're writing it down, aren't you? <laughs> Verse 30, the Philistine commanders continued to go out to battle, and as often as they did, David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officer, and his name became well known. Can you imagine that the first king of Israel's behavior Jealousy was so wretched and ugly and stinking, so bad, that it's written in Scripture for all time. You know, this kind of behavior. And we can identify with it if we all think about our own geometrical situations, you know? I don't know how many watch Everybody Loves Raymond. Been in reruns for, what, 20 years now? <laughs> And Doris Roberts plays uh, Robert, uh, Marie, yeah, the mother of Raymond and the mother-in-law of uh, Deborah. Deborah. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, she's always making coy little put-down remarks about Deborah's cooking or cleaning, housekeeping, the way she raises the kids, you know. 
My mother's mother-in-law, my grandma Walker, was really a good woman. I treasure my memories of her. But at times, she had a jealous streak. And uh, it was strange because back in the 60s when I was growing up, everybody had a, a home organ in their living room. Remember those little Hammond organs? They had the little rhythm machines. So everybody had one. Well, we got a brand new organ. My sister was a piano major, so she played me at the piano on one end of the living room. And then this great big Hammond, I think. And it was state of the art. It could do everything, you know. So every time people came to the house, my mother would have my sister do a demonstration for them on the big Hammond organ, you know. Those days were different. Remember when you got a new car and people would come over and you'd take them for a ride in your new car? Yeah. You know? I guess life was simpler, like, and everybody would, oh, it smells so nice, and drive around in the new car. And so you got a, a new organ in the living room, and I had to do, you know. So anyway, this, this thing did everything. Sounded like a trumpet, sounded like a drum, it could sound like a cathedral organ, all these things. And it was like a little 20-minute demonstration, and the people were going on. And then my grandmother came over, and my sister went through this whole mini-concert for her. Now this is her granddaughter. <laughs> And her daughter-in-law, you know, and her son's wife and daughter. And after the 20 minutes, my grandmother's remark was, well, I like an organ that sounds like an organ. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's just so ugly. You know, really, when you think of it, you know. Joshua Gabor, whom we least recently lost, said this. Being jealous, darling, of a beautiful woman is not going to make you more beautiful. <laughs> it didn't make my grandmother more beautiful, no. Kevin Bacon, a great theologian, said this. <laughs> Part of being a man is learning to take responsibility for your successes and your failures. You can't go blaming others or being jealous. Seeing someone else's success as your failure is a dangerous way to live. It's a good quote. See, when we see the difference between the way King Saul was acting and the way it just rolled off seemingly from David's back. And David wrote this psalm, Psalm 37. Starting in verse 1, he says this, Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. <coughs> Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. In contrast to King Saul's jealousy and his evil, we see David, again, just letting those abuses roll off like water off a duck's back as the expression goes. Romans says this in verse chapter 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. We don't want to behave like just mere humans. You know, we can have the impulses. We're all tempted all the time. As we talked about yesterday at the Spiritual Warfare Conference, we're, we are given decisions all the time. How are we going to act, react? Are we going to react in the spirit? Are we going to go to battle in the privacy of our prayer closet or are we going to take our, our spears through word or through deed and, and try to get even? Try to get back. If someone will let Stephanie know that uh, we're ready for to have, take uh, communion here as we uh, get ready to close. Let's close in prayer. Father, we, we know that everything you have in Scripture is to teach us and Lord, sometimes the sad thing is, Lord, that we don't see ourselves as David. We see ourselves as King Saul. And for that, Father, we ask you forgiveness. And we pray, Lord, that you change our hearts. That's why we come together, Lord, to gain instruction, to gain encouragement, to, to keep moving forward in the things of God, that we would be champions that we would not be simply mere humans, but Lord, that we would be champions for Jesus. So we pray, Father, that you would, any sorts of issues in our life, jealousies, hatreds, angers, 
unforgiveness. That we would put these things to rest. That we would bring them to the feet of Jesus. That we confess them. That you would cleanse us from this wrong. And you would bring us into right relationship. Not only with horizontally, Lord, with our brothers and sisters. But with our Father in Heaven. Lord, as we get ready to come to the communion table, we ask, Lord, that you prepare our hearts. Speak to us, Lord. Work in us so that we come to your table with clean hands. We ask this in Jesus' name. The Bible says that when we are getting ready to have the Lord's Supper, we should not come in an unworthy manner. That means we have to be related to Jesus. So if we are born again, if you've been born from above, then you come to the table. Now there are also times where we know something's not right. We've got sin in our life. We should confess that sin. Uh, bring that to God. Uh, maybe we need to confess it to a, a brother or sister in the church. And the Bible also says if you have something against a brother or a sister, then you need to go to them and make it right. It says when you come to bring your offering, Leave your offering and go and make things right. So we always want things to be right with some somebody. And and if it's somebody that you know that you maybe across the country or a relative, then you just commit in your heart and say, Okay, God, I will take communion. I'm committing myself. I'm gonna call my sister, I'm gonna call my friend back east that I've had a falling out with her or whomever, and make it right. So I just want to put that out before us and uh Let's take a few moments, uh, and I'll let you uh, play for a moment, and uh, prepare your hearts as we uh, get ready to come to the table. Uh, Gary, I'm going to ask you to come, and uh, if you would hold the tray for the uh, with us now. Stephanie, if you'll come forward, and we'll invite you to the table in just a moment here.